Hi, this is the Alt Shift X podcast, a monthly ish show about stories. Usually, this will just be me talking about whatever Alt Shift X video just came out, with extra content and details that didn't make it into the video, answering patron questions, stuff like that. Uh, but today, we've got some special guests. I spoke to Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank, the authors of the space sci fi series The Expanse. We've made seven Old Shift X videos about The Expanse, and I just caught up reading the latest books in the series because the ninth and final book of The Expanse is coming this year, and the TV adaptation has been renewed for season six. So it was really exciting to talk to Dan and Ty about the series. This interview is edited into two parts. This part, part one, has no spoilers for The Expanse. It's more about writing in general and Dan and Ty's careers, and one golden anecdote about Dan and Ty's friend, George R. R. Martin. Part two of the interview is a separate podcast episode, and that's got all the juicy, spoilery discussion about the later books of The Expanse, like Tiamat's Wrath. So, if you're scared of spoilers, you can avoid part two, but you're safe in this spoiler-free episode, part one. There are timestamps listed in the show notes of both parts, so you can skip around in the interview if you want and choose your own adventure. Uh, But this was a really fun chat, and I hope you enjoy listening. So, Daniel Abraham, Ty Frank, a decade ago, you were playing a role-playing game uh thought it'd be fun to write some novels based on it called the expanse thought you might make a little bit of pizza money uh 10 years later the fifth season of the tv adaptation has just aired you're you're renewed for season six and the ninth and final book in the series is set for publication this year how does it feel to have this massive project so very near to completion Vaguely exhausting? Yeah, know. yeah. That's what I was going to say, too. I, I mean, I won't speak for Daniel, um, but I'm about to speak for Daniel. Um, he's really tired. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we may have overtaxed him. Uh, it, yeah, it's been, a, it's, been a, it's been a long, exhausting process that got more exhausting as we went because... At one point, we were writing a book a year, which most people were like, oh my God, I don't know how you can crank out a book a year. And then somewhere in there, suddenly we were doing that plus writing and producing a season of television every year. Um, yeah, and, no, the, all of a sudden, and then we had Daniel Deja. decided, well, and Daniel decided he needed to also write a fantasy series because that, that is he's a not crazy my person. fault. That is not my fault. I did it when we were canceled. I signed the contract and we were, we were when sci-fi killed us and before we were we were uh, resurrected so uh yeah. that one in that in that two week period daniel managed to sign a contract for three more books <laughs> yeah well, he didn't bring you along to co right oh, oh no no i don't fantasy. i don't write fantasy yeah yeah oh interesting no. so w- w- would you ty always write sci-fi as james s.a Corey? would you would you write sci-fi as ty frank or would you how do you see your like future as a writer <laughs> um, the re- the reality is that more and more I'm getting sucked over to just being a TV writer. Um, but of course, we have three more sci-fi books to write as James S. A. Corey, and and you know we'll definitely be working on those over the next three years. Uh, but it turns out that I'm kind of good at producing writing and producing TV, and there is a hunger for TV content. So the siren song of come write a bunch of TV stuff is definitely playing right now. But honestly, if I was going to write something without Daniel under my own name, it almost certainly would be a horror project. Um, If I'm going to write sci-fi, I I enjoy writing that with Daniel. I would want to work with him. Even if I had a great sci-fi idea that I came up with on my own, I would probably pitch it to Daniel to see if he liked it. And we would write it under the James Corey, you know, pen name. Uh, Daniel writes his his fantasy solo. He knows I'm not interested. I'm guessing he probably wouldn't be interested in writing a horror novel, so I'd probably do that on my own if I was going to do it. Um, but uh, honestly, with three more sci-fi books, with the two of us working on three more sci-fi books, and the number of TV projects that are potentially 
in the works that pretty much would suck up my time for the next few years daniel of course the minute this phone call is done or this zoom call is done daniel will sign three more book contracts so i'm not, <laughs> I'm speaking not for signing i'm not signing any more book contracts anything else i do will be on spec oh for for two very exhausted people you seem to be taking on a lot more projects what's the fantasy thing you're starting daniel uh there was a this is actually the third fantasy series that i've done and it's been a gap since i did the last one because i just didn't have any i didn't know what there was that was interesting to do there for me um and then i found out what was interesting to do there for me so it's a the series of three books um, set in the same fantasy city in the same year. And it's three different people's stories with the other two going on in the background that all add up to something bigger than any single one of them. Awesome. So structurally, structurally, it's one of the more ambitious things I've done. Um, we'll see if I pull it off, but it's fun so far. I've read the first book. The, the, he finished the first book and I've read it. So you, you, uh, you fantasy readers out there should be excited. What's it called? When's it coming out? Uh, the first one is called uh, The Age of Ash. And I don't know the, the date for sure that it's coming out. It's uh, in with the, the editor right now. So um, my guess is early next year, but don't, don't quote me. What's the structure of it? If you've got like sort of one primary character and two secondary characters, is, is that what you're saying? Are they all equal no. like point of view characters? Or? No, they are. They are three separate stories with their own slightly overlapping sets of characters and background characters, all set in the same place at the same time. But they're three separate stories. The idea, the idea behind it was. Um, what makes epics epic i mean the whole the whole project that i've been doing with epic fantasy is what makes epic epic the first series i did was taking a few characters over the course of their whole lives so it was you know four books with the first of them starting off when they were young you know late teens early 20s and ending when they were uh, old and kind of building the epic sense of it that way um, the second series I did was kind of a traditional epic fantasy. Um, and this is one that's talking about how many stories there are in any given room. You know, you, if, you're, if you're in a room with 50 people, there's 50 absolutely um, unconnected, different experiences going on at the same time. And I'm playing with that idea in this this city where, you know, I have... Um, a love story and I have a, a, a guy who's um, working through his childhood dreams and seeing how they actually play out and I've got a thief who's uh, trying to avenge her brother or somehow keep him from having died and, I mean, it's, and it's, it's stories that are all self-contained they're all complete and they add up to something greater than just the three stories. Um, but you'll see somebody in the background. If there's a snowstorm in one uh, book at a particular time, that snowstorm happens in all three books because it's the same year. Um, but it means different things to different people. So for one person, maybe it's the, the chance to not have to go to work and so they get to do this other thing. For somebody else, they're caught out and they don't have a place to sleep. And it's the same storm seen in different aspects and the whole city's like the whole plot like that uh it's a it's a weird story it's a weird project i love that idea of you know one person who's just a minor background character in one person's story is the center of the whole own story which is which is its own whole thing because so much in fantasy and in science fiction it's centered around one heroic person and they are the prophesied destined person and they are the middle of the universe and no one and everyone else is just sort of secondary to that. But giving part humanity the reason, to the background players is awesome. Part of the reason I can't do a whole lot more epic fantasy is I've, I've kind of chewed through the idea of the the great chain of being and the the chosen one and the savior. And I'm, I'm kind of done. I'm kind of finished. I've I've I've. Uh, 
I've got this one last thing I'm going to say, and then I don't know what exactly there is to say after that. Yeah. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I think I think last time we spoke, like four years ago, you were talking about how Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer changed your perspective on the idea of cosmic horror because you'd seen yeah. like Lovecraftian cosmic horror, which is all sort of like xenophobia and a particular kind of fear. But Annihilation is about a kind of alien, organic, biological kind of cosmic horror and how that and sort of changed your view yeah there was a there was there is a a a horror story that um i have outlined and i want to do at some point in which the the source of the horror the cosmic horror is coming out of narrative coming out of story but I'm living in a post-Trump America, and I'm not sure how to tell that story right now. Um, that's a, well, it's, it's I mean, too little close. Yeah, it's tricky with like the culture of online discussion and fandom. It's become this huge beast that didn't exist before. How, how do you guys approach that? Like when you guys release a season of TV or a new book, or like when you when the final book of The Expanse comes out, will you guys be trawling through the tweets and the reddit posts and the youtube videos or will you be just washing your hands of it like how, how do you interact with the online fandom if somebody tweets directly at james s a Corey, i probably see some percentage of those i don't i don't scroll through all of them and look at all of them but i see some percentage of those um i guarantee you i have never gone through and read all the youtube comments <laughs> i i don't <laughs> care um, I, I, I was on Reddit for about five minutes and then I stopped. Um, and, and that is not to bash Reddit. I, there's a thriving Reddit fan community for the expanse. And I am very happy that those guys exist and, uh, I'm not bashing them, but I, there's nothing that I'm going to read there that makes me better at making the things that I make. And, um, there's, there's, uh, Daniel taught me this very early on that there's, there's two versions of this and they're both bad for you. Either you read a bunch of criticism and you take a tart and you think you're terrible. That's wrong and it's bad for you. Or you read a bunch of like glowing praise, you take a tart and you think you're awesome. That's also wrong and it's bad for you. So there's no version of this that makes you better at your job. The best version of this is where you, you stay sort of focused on the craft of what you're doing and let people's reaction to that thing be what it is. You know, you separate yourself from that reaction as much as possible um, and, and hope that their reaction is good. But uh, the, the really bad thing is when you get in there, you start trying to guide the reaction. When you get in, you start arguing with the fans. You start, you know, somebody criticizes you and you start explaining why you were right and they're wrong. That's, I've seen a lot of writers get sucked into that. And that is so self-destructive. You, you cannot do that. That, um, that is a terrible and, path to go down. And there, there is a, an, an argument by which it's kind of a party foul for us to get too involved in a fan conversation because we're not fans. And we're coming yeah. in with a different uh, level of authority, a different level of power, a different level of status. And the more we are involved in that conversation, the less it belongs to other people. Yeah, th there is nothing less charismatic than punching down and owning a fan. <laughs> like, there is no winning in that situation. Like, if they win the argument, you lost the argument. And if you win the argument, congratulations, you've owned one of your fans. You've, you've, and, you've... and you lost the argument. Yeah. Now, I mean, ultimately. If, you, if yeah. you tweet at James S.A. Corey with some racist or sexist bullshit, yeah. He's going to curb stop you. I've that's noticed. different, though. If, <laughs> yeah, if you tweeted James S. A. Corey, I hated your book. Jimmy's not going to respond that. to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. I don't care. If you tweet it, Jimmy, you have black people in your book, and I hate that, and you should stop writing about black people. Yeah. Jimmy's probably going to stomp you a little bit. <laughs> but that's a very different sort of interaction, I think. Um, so the, the, the thing Daniel's talking about, where you like, or what you're talking about, where you start arguing with the fans about their criticism. I mean, you should be safe to write whatever you want to write and fans should be safe to express their opinion. Yeah. They shouldn't, they shouldn't feel like you're a threat to them because they've expressed their opinion. It's fine for them to have an opinion. 
Yeah, there, uh, there's there's yeah. Uh, at least one thing in the expanse that is almost uh, I won't say universally uh, derided as a bad decision that I personally made that I'm actually still pretty still pretty happy with it. I still would have done it. So um, me getting in there and and explaining myself and and arguing that I that the decision I made was right. Yeah, it's not going to make anybody's day better. I still think I'm right. They still think I'm wrong. That's fine. There's um there's a line from Tia Matt's Wrath, and this isn't a spoiler, but I instantly thought of this when you said that. Naomi says that she wants she wants peace. She wants the war over, and she wants the kind of peace where people can be angry with each other and hate each other, and no one has to die over it. And that's yeah. kind of what you're saying. There will always be assholes who disagree on the internet, and that's fine. That's always going to be true. We just need to find ways to disagree without murdering each other or driving each other insane in the YouTube comments. There's, there's, also, there's also something about electronic media and has been since the beginning. I mean, I was my first experience on the internet was uh, the late 80s. We were doing uh, internet relay chat. Um, at the, the the university and as soon as it was um, text on a screen being bounced off a server in Kentucky to somebody else's screen um, the flame war began uh, it, it's it's built into the DNA of this method of communication that uh, it gives it it encourages the lowest kinds of conflict i don't know how to fix that <laughs> so i I'll, I'll tell you a story so my first I, i've never been a social media guy i've never had a facebook account i like never never been that guy but very early on in my first little forays onto the internet this is you know way back in the late 90s i guess um I was on a message board for a famous writer. Like I was a fan of that person's work and I went on their message board and I was interacting with other fans. And very early on, there were live meetups of these people that, that like people would meet up in person and hang out and stuff. And so I never got the version of the internet early on in my formative internet years where each of those people was faceless. Like I knew a lot of these people in person. I had met them. Like we'd gone out you know, and had a picnic or a party or whatever. And so that version didn't exist. And I remember having a fight with somebody, an internet fight with somebody that I had met and I, I, I knew them and they, they got pretty nasty. And I remember at one point I, I wrote on the forum, I said, you know, I know where you live and I can afford a plane ticket, right? <laughs> and the person wrote back and said, you know what? You're absolutely right. And I'm really sorry about getting that aggressive. And, <laughs> and it was like immediately it just squashed it. That, that the fact that you're dealing with another human being changes the way you interact. And I think what Daniel's talking about is 100% right, that, that the fact that we feel like we're not dealing with human beings, that it is a computer persona that we're dealing with, allows us to go beyond what we would normally go. I mean, most people agree that the, the way you see people act on the internet is not how they act in person. And, and I think that that's a big part of it. They don't feel like real people. And the minute somebody goes, you know, I'm a real person and I can come to your house. Everybody goes, oh, wait a minute. Right. I wouldn't behave this way if you were standing in front of me and I should change my behavior now. Yeah, I think with the Internet, we accidentally built a system that is optimized to alienate and dehumanize each other. Uh, and we're only starting to yep. r realize the consequences of that. And. Circling back to The Expanse, I love how you <laughs> depict the internet in The Expanse because it's a decentralized internet. It's a it's a it's it's many clusters of local internets because you can't go faster than the speed of light, which means that um, there are these feeds that are transmitted across between the planets and the star systems. But um, direct yeah, but the ping the ping time is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. That, that's Starcraft 2 uh, between Mars and Earth. The ping is terrible. <laughs> it would suck. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. So I have some questions about like the writing process. Um, so, you know, The Expanse 
is set mostly on spaceships, space stations, weird physics breaking alien moons. And there's a lot of like counterintuitive physics going on there, like thrust gravity, spin gravity, vacuum of space, which is very unfamiliar for those of us who haven't been to space. And there are some settings that are really hard to describe with words alone, like that winding ramp in the behemoth that goes from like the spinning drum to the no gravity command center and stuff. Like, so so how, how do you approach that challenge of describing these very visual, spatial, unfamiliar spaces with just words? And was it a revelation to be able to depict some of those things visually in TV? Part of the part of the, the depicting them on TV is uh, explaining them ad nauseum to people who are trying to build them. Um, so that's it. Didn't really get you off the hook trying to explain <laughs> what was going on. I would say, uh, writing style wise, that the one of the traits that Daniel and I both share is a as, as a certain clarity of writing. Neither of us are particularly flowery when it comes to description. Um. We tend to just use simple declarative sentences a lot. And I think that's a writing style that works well for this kind of weirdness. Um, if, you, if you're describing something that's very weird and you use a lot of very flowery sort of language to describe it, it just becomes impenetrable. Uh, yeah, I think if you describe something that's very strange and use the most simple and, and uh, clear way of describing it, then it becomes understandable. Um, and it's still I, weird. I think, I think yeah, it's still weird, but I, I, think, I think our natural attack on writing works well for the kind of things we were doing. Um, and it's also become yeah. kind of intuitive for us over the past decade. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we, we had to spend a lot of time explaining spin gravity and working out, you know, well, what's it like when you're on a, a ship that's accelerating at 2G and then one unbalanced thruster fires, what does that feel like? You know, there's, there's a certain amount of homework that we've done to internalize that. So, you know, it, when it's uh, a question of, well, all right, how are we gonna, what is it like to go from this ship to that ship when they're uh, uh, working on different vectors? We, we kind of have some experience imagining that. Um, yeah. And having an experienced imagination for that kind of thing uh, makes, you know, describing it not that hard. You just see what it looks like and then write that down. Yeah, and, and I, I think the process actually helps us with that because the process is two people always look at it. So yeah. if I describe something or if Daniel describes something, if the other person reads it and it's not clear, our first job in the first rewrite is to clarify. So um, I think a lot of the early rewrite that each of us do for the other person is clarity. Um, it, it, that's, I, I mean, the, probably the most common note that I, either of us send to the other, you know, so, so somebody will say, I've sent you chapter 35, the other person will write back. And it's almost always, uh, tweak some clarity issues. You know, I'm sending it back. Fix some typos. <laughs> yeah. Typos and clarity issues are always the thing. So typos, I think the typos, fact that clarity and re reusing the same word 18 different times in the same paragraph. <laughs> right. But, but I think the fact that there's a there's an immediate like backstop of I thought that was clear when I wrote it. Daniel reads it and he goes, I don't have any idea what you were describing there. I think that helps a lot. That if 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 I describe something and Daniel immediately understands it without me having to explain it, then it was probably clearly described. Yeah, it's really cool having that sort of built in peer review where where constantly throughout the process you're You've got fresh eyes on the work to make sure it makes sense. We also we also have beta reader, um, we, and we have an editor, and it's not like it's just the two of us, and we're the the auteurs who uh, do this with through our own genius with no feedback. It's a it's a team effort. Every book, whether they folks admit it or not, is a team effort. Uh, it's just our team's a little bit bigger because there's two of us at this stage. How do you manage notes about your world? Like, The Expanse is nine books long. It's got lots of characters, lots of world building, lots of history. 
how, how do you physically manage all the all the notes and the material that you need to know and remember? Have you got some giant Word document or an Excel spreadsheet? How, how does that work physically? We, we have nine giant Word documents and they're all novels. Yeah. Um, well, and, and th the reason that, forgive me for speaking for you, Daniel, but the reason that Daniel first pitched us writing this book together is because he would ask me questions about the world that I had set up for the game and I would know the answers that if I have a superpower, if I have one superpower, it is that when I, when I come up with a setting for a game, which is what I used to do a lot is come up with settings for games, somehow like the entire setting pops fully formed into my head. And like just the way everything works is so obvious and, and like immediate. And so what everything is supposed to look like and how everything is supposed to work. Like, it's not like I created something and I have to write it down. That place actually exists for me. And it's sort of like, you know, somebody says, Hey, remember that time you went to France and you just sort of think and you go, Oh yeah, that's right. I walked down the street and there was the cool art gallery at the end of the street. And there was that coffee shop off the left. That's what it's like for me going to the expanse. You know, Daniel will go, how do ships work? Or how does that one thing work? Like, I, I'm not creating something new. I'm remembering because the whole thing sort of exists for me. Um, and very early on in the first few books, that's how everything was done. It's just Daniel would say, how does this thing work? At this point, I think Daniel is probably most of the way there as well. Like, he, like if you ask Daniel how something works in the expanse, he's going to answer it the same way I would. And we had multiple books that we'd already finished that if one of us forgot something, like he's saying, we have, you know, nine books worth of material we can search, you know, you got the electronic version you can search on. Uh, but I think early on, it was mostly just like this, this world existed for me and um, all the sort of game worlds that I've come up with just exist. Uh, Daniel and his wife and my wife and his daughter were playing a game together, uh, in D and D and like, if I think about that world, that whole world like pops into my head. Um, everything that's going on, who all the political players are, the stuff that they're trying to accomplish. Um, that's the, it, it, in the team, that's the thing I bring to the team. Uh, Daniel's, and, you know, and a it, much better. And it's, a superpower. <laughs> it's a superpower that to be able to do that kind of depth of world building kind of intuitively. I, I can't do that. Um, so yeah, no, that was absolutely what part of the thing that drew me to this was that he'd done all the hard work, uh, and I got to just write some books. It was great. <laughs> that doesn't see to see what's funny to me is like <laughs> writing the books seems hard. Coming up with the world seems super easy. So yeah. like Daniel and so I they, both think the, the, the opposite thing is hard. Yeah. The, the part of what has made the, the, the creative partnership as successful as it's been as each of us kind of feels like the other guy does the hard work. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect partnership, isn't it? That's symbiosis. When you each have the specialty that, that the other one needs that that's great. I wonder, it's obvious how you, how, how this partnership has worked for both of you. What's, what's the biggest disagreement that you've ever had? Has there ever been like a plot point or a character that you've wanted to take in two different directions that you saw in different ways? What, what, what's the biggest disagreement you've had in writing the expanse? I, I was uh, too soft-hearted to kill. Spoiler. I had to talk me into it. And he did. He was right. He was right. I was just like, but, but do we have to? And I was like, yeah, we do. So that, that's uh, generally speaking, though, there's the very few issues that we haven't been able to, you know, kind of argue. Yes, but this would be more awesome. Yeah, that that's the thing is is when you agree on what the project is supposed to be, that stuff doesn't come up because you know, very early on we agreed that we're always trying for the most awesome version of everything. Best idea wins. And there's been plenty of times where I had an idea for how a chapter should go, how a sequence should go, and I'm telling Daniel and he's like, "Yeah, but what if this other thing happened?" And if you're being honest, if you leave your ego at the door, if you're not trying to drag your ego into it, you sit there and you go, well, yeah, obviously that's better. Like, let's do that. 
I mean, that, that happens all the time. And, and if you're not bringing your ego to it, it's, it's so obvious which idea is better, I think. I mean, has it ever been where like the best idea wasn't just obvious once we talked it out? It, like, I can't think of one. There, there, there have the, the only time I remember, I mean, there are like, yeah, the very few, there, there was the, the, the method of getting people off the, the Barbara Piccola in the Cibola burn. Well, but that's what I'm talking about is like, and I had my yeah, version. And, and I, you pitched your version, and I was like, "Well, that's yeah, amazing, that's, and we should do that." Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 I can think of times when I had to pitch an idea, but I yeah. can't think of an idea where it was like, "Yeah, I can't, I I can't come up with them. I don't, I got nothing. I'm drawing a blank." That's I mean, awesome. honestly, I I have to spend way more time convincing uh, Noreen Shankar, the showrunner on The Expanse, way more time ex- convincing him I'm right than I ever have to spend on Daniel or he has to spend on me for, for Daniel and I, like, it's like a five minute conversation, but uh, you know, it's like, well, I, I see what you're saying and, and your idea is not terrible, but what if we did my idea and the other person just immediately goes, well, yeah, that's way better. Of course, let's do that. Um, every now and then Noreen and I will butt heads and I have to spend half an hour convincing him. And I know you have the same experience, Daniel. It's like every now and then you butt heads, you have to spend half an hour convincing him of something. Well, yeah, or we need to get lunch because we're yelling at each other. Um, but, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little sensitive on blood sugar for that one. But you know, the 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 number of fights that uh, Ty and I have had about how to write the expanse are, is zero. Uh, that's so cool, and and it must have been such a tricky learning curve going from that harmonious partnership of just the two of you or mostly just the two of you into the tv adaptation which is suddenly dozens and dozens of people in studios and you know h- how was it to suddenly learn to uh, all these different people's demands and suddenly having a lot more people who you had to convince in order to make things happen well really uh, it was mostly the rain we had to convince <laughs> Yeah. Uh, we, the nice thing about this is there is a showrunner, and it is the he's he's the creatively the the last word, and we happened to get somebody who has a very similar view of the best idea winning, um, and who's more interested in the quality of the project than that every single decision be his own. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was just and- that was just good fortune. And I, and I feel like if I convince Daniel that I'm right and I convince Noreen that I'm right and all three of us agree something is right, then it's right. And anybody who disagrees with us is just wrong. And uh, I feel like, you know, very early on, I learned that that was true. And, and so, um, you know, when like a studio or a network or somebody else disagrees or wants to change something, uh, part of what they're looking for is is that you have the the strength of your convictions that that you have a good idea that you're that you're confident in your idea, and often confidence will win them over. And I I learned early on that if Daniel agrees with me and Noreen agrees with me, I'm probably right, and I feel pretty confident. And so and, you know we could attack those other disagreements from a position of strength. And the thing for me, anyway, coming into it with the the visual medium is that Narain understood the visual medium in a way I don't. So there would be some things where he wanted to do something one way, and I thought it was a bad idea. We needed to do it this other way, and we'd argue about it. And he would just say, "No, really, trust me. Filmically, this will work." And I would go, "Ah, oh, fine, all right, you know, sure." And then we'd actually see the cut and be like, "Yeah, no, you're right. That I that totally worked. I did not think that would work." Because this is not my natural language, it is yours. Sometimes the LV guys got to pull rank. Well, I think well, I think for Daniel, the trickiest part about switching to writing for TV was writing for a camera. Oh yeah, uh, and, and and early on that was and 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 trust me, that's a not a, that's not an intuitive thing. If you're a prose writer, if you're a if you're a novelist, learning how to write for a camera is not intuitive. The thing that my, the, the penny drop moment for me was when I was talking to Narain about, I don't, some script, I don't know what it was, one of them. Um, and he, 
was able to distinguish for me the 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 storytelling in the script from the storytelling in the tone meeting where you could say okay here's all of this you know because i'm trying to get everybody's internal lives and what they're thinking and feeling and i'm putting it in the script and it just doesn't belong there um it belongs in a bunch of other meetings that are going on and a bunch of other conversations that are off the page and once he said that i understood but i'm so used to writing something that is big enough to carry all of its own context and has to carry all of its own context. I just wasn't noticing all of the rest of the process around it. Uh, that's, that's really critical. Like well, the, music. Yeah, the other, yeah, I've seen, I was I've just about to talk about the, about the music. Yeah. 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 It, there, there was the other one for Daniel where, where we, it, this was in the writer's room where Noreen was, was bucking on a line and Daniel's like, well, how will the audience know that the person is sad? And Noreen said, the soundtrack will tell them. And, it's like, and oh, right. Ooh. We have music. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do, no, do you ever go back and feel froze. limited then when like you're writing a book that's just a book and you're like, God, I know exactly the sounds and the camera angles. Like once you learn the language of TV, you're stripped of that language when you are writing a novel. Is that ever limiting? Yeah. R prose was my first love. It's where I'm most comfortable. So going back doesn't hurt. Um, going to learn learning the the script language was actually hard but now going back and forth between them isn't isn't even tricky yeah i think i think script writing was an easier leap for me but the problem with that is that when i go back and write prose now i slip into all my old back ha bad habits because early on um, my bad habit was not describing the setting, you know, sensory detail, that kind of thing. You know, Daniel would give me shit. He'd be like, this is a great scene and it takes place in a white void. Um, uh, that, and he was right. Like, uh, you know, do, what does the room look like? What does the couch feel like? What is smells are in the air? Those sorts of things. It was hard for me to remember to include those details. I did eventually learn to do that. Then I started writing scripts and I just lost all of that because well, and in scripts, I don't do that. And then, so when I go back and write prose, like I have to remember, oh, you have to describe the couch. Like a, a set decorator isn't going to put a couch in this scene for me. So I have to actually describe it. But more than that, that's the storytelling and the description in prose. There's this, you know, whether the, the couch is uh, blood red or, uh, cherry red, That's that can be the same couch, but it says something different. Um, and all of that detail still exists in the, the, the TV, but it's the set decorator who's making those details, who's, uh, who's, who's finding that storytelling moment. One of the things that was revelatory about TV is how much storytelling there is in stuff you don't think is still in story. Um, the the sound design the 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 way the cuts are done there's just a tremendous amount of craft work going on there that was invisible to me when i wasn't actually putting my hands in it and now a quick ad break humans haven't yet colonized space like in the expanse but we're getting closer to mars there's a documentary on CuriosityStream called Packing for Mars, which tells the true story of the quest to settle an alien world. CuriosityStream has thousands of documentaries about space, science, technology, and history, and you can get CuriosityStream in a bundle with Nebula. Nebula is an independent, creator-owned video site where we don't have to worry about YouTube's demonetization or the algorithm. It has exclusive content from people like Tom Scott, Tierzu, Lindsay Ellis, Wendover, and Alt-Shift X. At the link in the show notes, you can get Nebula and CuriosityStream for a year for just 15 bucks. You get heaps of quality documentaries and videos, and you're supporting some great creators and supporting this podcast. So sign up at curiositystream.com slash ASXpod. Well, speaking of your future work, I think, so you're signed to write another science fiction trilogy as James S. A. Corey, separate to The Expanse. And I think you described it as being like, if The Expanse is more sort of Larry Niven sort of sci-fi, this new trilogy is more like Ursula Le Guin, Frank Herbert kind of sci-fi, I think you said. C could you 
speak on that? What what can we expect from this new trilogy? <laughs> uh, you know, obviously we don't want to spoil it, but uh, you know, where, when I said that jokingly, um, what I was thinking is Frank Herbert is is very far future. You know, the expanse is tomorrow. The expanse is you know fifty years in the future on to one hundred fifty years in the future kind of feel to it, right? Um, Whereas Frank Herbert is, you know, it's 50,000 years in the future and all these dramatic things have changed about the human race and, and dropping you into this very sort of alien but still human kind of world. Uh, that's something we're interested in is, is, is exploring that sort of very far future stuff. And the thing with Ursula Le Guin is, is how societies are structured and, and how things like gender and and um role you know gender roles in society and um uh those sorts of things create societies and and the things that arise out of you know like i'm thinking we're thinking like left hand of darkness you know that kind of so like how does the 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 way in which gender exists in left hand of darkness change the society of those of that species um sort of exploring those sorts of things, uh, not specifically always with gender, but just the ways in which the biology of a species changes the way a species expresses itself um, is, is something I'm really interested in. It's not something we did in The Expanse because The Expanse is very human and very sort of immediate, but, but ex exploring this sort of future version of things is something we're both interested in. Mm. Daniel, feel free to uh, disagree. Uh, it's, we're, no, I, I don't disagree. <laughs> we're, I think, I think what we're doing is going to the other end of space opera. I mean, we we did the 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 mandate of the expanse was to go from uh, late Apollo thirteen to early Buck Rogers. I think we did that, um, and now there's this other thing. Um, and the other, the other name that we haven't mentioned, but I think I feels like it's in the DNA of it is Rogers Elasny. Yeah. Um, I yeah. A hundred percent. What the, was the, his most popular book again? Well, probably the most popular was, uh, the, the, uh, Amber series, nine princes and Amber and, and on from there. But he also did, I think, uh, what was the, the one with the highway that, that's getting actually a, a treatment now. Somebody's actually filming that one. Uh, uh, it's in development. Okay. I don't think they're actually filming it, but oh. yeah, I know the one you're talking about. It's uh, uh shit. Uh, the name Probably of it is one out of it. But yeah. it, you know, the other, the other one is um, uh, my favorite science fiction novel of all time is Lord of Light, which is Rogers Lesney. And, and it is a very, very, very far future human society where technology has altered some very fundamental things about their biology and how the culture that they exist in arises from those fundamental changes in the, in the physiology of the people. Um, so yeah, I think we're going to owe Roger dinner, uh, you know, two <laughs> out of this Roger and, and, and Frank and Ursula. Did you ever read um, Doris Lessing and Shikasta and that stuff? I read Doris Lessing. I didn't read that one. Yeah, I, I never finished it, but it's a very far future, strange, spiritual imagining of um, very interesting kind of sci-fi. I, I, I think that part of the, the challenge is keeping that sense of accessibility. Yeah. Keeping it something where it's, it's you know, even as you're dealing with these kind of really heady, um, far future issues um and and settings and and the kind of exotic change also keeping it grounded enough that it is meaningful to the reader uh, that's going to be that's going to be fun that's going to be fun yeah no that that sounds awesome i always love fiction and, and sci-fi that really tries to push at something experimental and unusual and 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 boundary crossing um, but of course the trick is always making it, uh, something that people are going to read, you know, accessibility. Yeah, there, was a, there was a, there was a run there when I feel like science fiction really got into that sort of, uh, fusion jazz mode of being written for people who were already 
really sophisticated in the conventions of the genre. And it just, it, it, uh, I think didn't do any favors for the genre of bringing in new readers. Yeah. Um, kind of the, the, the post cyberpunk period there. Uh, and then, you know, Scalzi showed up with old man's war and people could actually access it again. Now, Ty is frozen for me. Is he frozen for you? Yeah, I probably need to change the battery in my camera. It'll take one second. I okay. assumed he was just sitting very still. <laughs> uh, have you seen any of those recent... Like, there are a few, like, sort of big-budget HBO sci-fi shows that are trying to do some ambitious things, like like Westworld and Raised by Wolves on HBO I, I both enjoyed. I have this thing. When I'm making something, I can't engage with it for fun. Hmm. Uh, I, when I'm writing epic fantasy, I cannot read epic fantasy. When I'm making, you know, I'm I'm ten years behind in science fiction right now. I, I haven't been able to read it since we've been doing this. I haven't been able to watch it much. I actually literally have all of the Murderbot books right here. My my wife's copy of all the Murderbot stuff. <laughs> that now that we're done, I can read it. I just couldn't read it before. Do, so, do you find that it bleeds into the work? that you're writing is is that the issue no it's just not fun i'm just spending more time at work yeah um you know i i, I if if uh if i'm spending all day thinking about science fiction and future and robots and you know aliens and then i'm doing that and then i, I would like to do i would like to you know i watched all of jane the virgin there's no science fiction in there it was great yeah i had a great time i just need to need to have some variety there. I can't do the same thing when I'm for fun that I'm doing when I'm working. It's not, it's not a, a, a bleeding thing. It's just an exhaustion thing. People my ask me problem, why I don't watch YouTube. Yeah. Right. <laughs> my, my problem is that I, when I'm watching a sci-fi show, I spend so much time thinking about this stuff that I generally jump to where they're going. And if I think it's a dumb idea, I just fall out of it. Like, I watched the first nine episodes of Westworld and I was like, oh, this is really interesting. I, I'm, I'm really intrigued by this premise. And then I watched the 10th episode of the first season. I was like, oh, I know what they're doing. And I never watched another episode. <laughs> like, I, 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 like as soon as I understood what they were trying to do, I fell out of the show. Um, that's the problem that I have is, is I need a show to surprise me and, and outwit me. And most TV is not trying to do that. And I'm not and blaming TV for that. And you're sophisticated now in a way that you weren't before. I mean, the more you learn yeah. about stuff, the the more you understand the form, the more you understand what the constraints are, the, the more yeah. legible it becomes. That's just normal. Yeah. That happens yeah. with books too. But, and there's, there's nothing more dispiriting than going back to, as a novelist, to reading a book that you just loved when you didn't know anything and it turns out it was terrible i just uh my my wife and i uh i read i read to her and we just revisited a book that we both just loved when we were in our 20s and read this thing it's like why why did we love this this is this is terrible everything about this book is bad and we loved it it was great so there's a there's a price to, to me, one of the most reassuring feelings in the world is going back to something that I loved or something that I made and I thought was good years ago, revisiting it and thinking, wow, that's shit. And I find that reassuring because <laughs> I'm like, well, that means that I've grown. If, if I yeah. still yeah. loved the things yeah. that I loved as a kid as much as I do now, then I, I would still be a kid. So, so, so do you guys ever have the experience of like, you know, going back to something that you've written years ago and thinking... Oh, that's kind of trash. But thinking, well, that that just sort of goes to show that I've I'm getting better at this. I do not reread my old stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the the problem that I have, uh, and Daniel has this problem too, but he's he's probably not thinking about it. Is um, you write a script, and 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 at the senior level that Daniel and I are at, we write a lot of scripts that don't have our names on them. So, uh, you know, it's a uh, staff writer, junior writer will write a script and then the showrunner will ask you to take a pass on it and do a rewrite. And so there's a lot of, there's, there, I, what I'm trying to say is every season there are way more scripts written by one of us than have our names on them. And the problem with that is because we're senior 
producers on the show, we are also involved in all of the editing process. So you get to watch the actual filmed version of your script about a thousand times. And after a something, few times, you're just sitting there going, oh my good God. good at about 700. 700, you're like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, and you're just watching going, why did I write that line? What is wrong with me? And then, and then you know, in one of those edit, editing runs, the showrunner will go, you know, can we just, can we just cut that line from the edit? Can we just cut out of that and not have it in there? And you're just sitting there like rubbing your face going, I know, I know, I shouldn't have put it in there. What's wrong with me? So, so when you're, when you're working on TV at the level that Daniel and I are at, you will have every mistake you make in writing rubbed in your face over and over and over again. So yes, absolutely. We experience what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's almost like you have that like iterative process of like growing and revising and revisiting except instead of doing that process over 10 years you do it within the weeks yes. of writing the writing and editing process is the process of revisiting and revisiting and thinking and growing until you hate yeah. it and you remake it and then it's and it's done yeah, yeah that's awesome and it, i would love to be able to see the show that other people are seeing yeah. i'm never going to be able to yeah yeah yeah, do you, do you find you, you see the flaws and you see the oh, the, the sweat and, and you see the... nothing else. And the yeah. missed opportunities and you remember that this was indeed the absolute best take of that scene and it's still just, yeah, it's not what you had in mind exactly and yeah. Well, and and as a, as a I've done a lot more on-set producing than Daniel has just because of... Because he, the I have a kid and I... Yeah. yeah, just because of the circumstances we were in at the time, uh, I wound up doing a lot more of that. And there's all those moments where I'm watching an episode and I'm going, if I had been there on set when they shot that, I would not have let them do that. Like I would have, I would have called foul. I would have gone talk to the director. I would have said, please don't do it this way. And I wasn't like when they shot that, I was up in the office getting coffee or I was working with the rain, rewriting something, or I was over with the art department and God damn it. I wish I had been on set because I would have caught that thing. Um, and you see all of them. And I'm sure Narain yeah. as the showrunner, every episode he watches, he's probably like, I wish I had rewritten that script. I wish I had rewritten that line. I wish I hadn't let them put that in the script. I'm sure he does that for every episode. Uh, we're we're all doing it, yeah. In infamously, in the final season of Game of Thrones, there were not one but two occasions in which coffee cups or a plastic bottle was visible in frame, like pretty conspicuously, in the version that was released to the public. Um, oh, I don't know. I don't. I, I so I know David and Dan who run Game of Thrones. I think they're very smart guys. I think they're both very talented writers. I'm baffled by that last season. I have to admit, I'm just <laughs> baffled by it. Believe I, me, I, you are not the only one. Well, and I don't want to badmouth those guys because I think they're both brilliant guys. I, I have enormous respect for them both as, as, as writers and as people. I've, I've hung out with them both. They're both very, they're good guys, right? And I watched that last season and I'm just I'm like, I, what, what is, what's going on here? What, what's happening? Well, and Part of, I mean, not to, to uh, you know, have this be a Game of Thrones thing. Um, ending a thing is really, really hard. And we're, yeah. I mean, we're in a position right now where we got two things ending at the same time. We got the last book going in. We got the the sixth season, which if it's, if it's not the end, it's at least a pause. Um, it's, it's uh really easy to get exhausted sticking the landing is tough yeah what one of the i mean of course when they released those episodes with the coffee cup in them they then edited the coffee cup out replaced the episodes with these fixed versions um reminds me of kanye west put out an album and then he revised and remixed the songs like three or four times and and he, and he fixed his album um and replaced the version that was available and you can no longer get the original version of the life of pablo you only get the fixed version uh, stephen king rewrote the gunslinger he, he he redid the gunslinger right so i mean do, do you 
Do you think it would be dangerous to have the ability or the inclination to edit works that you've already published? Like, especially as we move into ebooks, it would be very possible to replace your version of Leviathan Wakes if you just wanted to tweak, revise, you know, punch up a few of the chapters here and there. W- w- would that ever be tempting to you? And do you think it would drive you insane if you had the power to alter finished things that you've published? I th- I think it would be a waste of time. Um, but, yeah, I, I I I understand the impulse. I understand the the temptation. Um, but um, I mean the the catharsis that you get from doing this is being done. Uh, I. I I would rather do something flawed and have it exist than uh, try to, you know, introduce some new flaws. And and Daniel and I both know people who have spent the last 20 years rewriting the same book. Yeah. And in that same amount of time, you could have written 20 books. So the 20th one would be pretty good. The 20th one would be pretty awesome, right? <laughs> um so rather than rewrite Leviathan Wakes, I'd much rather write whatever the next thing is. Because uh, that thing is going to be so much better than you know, the previous 10 things I did because I'm better at it now. Uh, it's just, yeah. yeah. And, and the, uh, there is a, an idea that um, you, you keep messing with it and it keeps getting better. That's not... True. <laughs> that's, that's a there's there is a point at which a project is overcooked and you have been with it too long, uh, yeah. and it just keeps getting worse after that. I heard a story where a school class was tasked with making wooden boxes, and one half of the class was told, "You're going to make one wooden box, and your goal is to make the best possible wooden box." So these kids spent all year carving and planing and shaping the wooden box. The other half of the class. They said, you'll be graded on how many boxes you can make. Just make a whole lot of boxes. And the kids who who had to make lots and lots of boxes, made dozens of boxes, they made better boxes than the kids who were told to make the best box that you can. Because by overcooking one project, it's not as effective as just doing something, making a whole bunch of new things. That's the best way to get better at something. I find that emotionally convincing, yes. I mean, if you're making 10 boxes, your 10th box is going to be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have learned all the lessons of the previous nine boxes, right? Yeah. Yeah, The only way to make something good is to make a lot of um, crappy things. That has always been my belief. I I mean, my first writing teacher told me that uh, when you start writing, you have a thousand pages of crap in you and you have to write until you get a thousand pages of crap out of your system. Yeah. And then your thousand and one page is going to be pretty good, but... You got to get that thousand pages of crap out of your system. Took me a little more than that. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of like that level of planning, I was wondering about the titles of the Expanse books. Like I, I like the symmetry of Leviathan Wakes being the first book and Leviathan Falls being the final book. And you've got lots of cool, you know, myth- mythological references, Shakespeare references, Caliban's War, Tiamat's Wrath. How long have you known the titles of the Expanse books did you know from the start that it would be leviathan wakes and leviathan falls no that was that was actually daniel's pitch um daniel has pitched titles twice in the series i i I usually come up with the titles i thought he he pitched a fantastic title for book three that the publisher didn't like yeah but i I thought his title was amazing and the publisher didn't like it yeah Yeah. Yeah. if 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 they hadn't squashed it, Daniel would have titled book three. And when we got to the last book, Daniel pitched Leviathan Falls. I actually didn't like it. I was like, no, that's not right. Um, I, had to be, I had to be talked into it. I had to be convinced into it. But I, I think you're right. I think, I think it is the right title for the end. I think Daniel was right about it. And, and even though I had to be talked into it, I, I'm glad that I was. I think I think he had the right instinct, and I my in, my initial instinct was wrong. Yeah, although I suppose strictly speaking, if the first book is Leviathan Wakes, the 
the right mirror for the last book would be Leviathan goes back to sleep and has a long nap. Yeah, I think we're not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> Leviathan snoozes is not a great title. <laughs> and, in, and in fairness, there is one more book coming out after this. There's the, the short story collection coming yeah. out next year where we take all of the novellas and almost all the novellas and short stories and put them in one thing. So we got one more title coming. Oh, and, and speaking of which, that was another title Daniel came up with. So, so Daniel t- also titled uh, the, the collection. So you have a title. Yeah. Can you reveal what it is? I think we can. It's out, isn't it? I think so. I have seen yeah, it think, mentioned in the world. Yeah, other people have talked about it. Yeah, so uh, the, the name for the, the collection is Memories Legion. Ooh. Cool. Because nobody knows who Mnemnosony is, so uh, we went for memory instead, so. Who? Mnemnosity? Who? Mnemnosity, mother of muses. Memory. Oh, is that Greek? Yep. Cool. Yeah, no, that's lovely. And is it going to have the same uh, cover style and and visual design so it looks all nice next to my other nine? I (laughs) think so. It would be sad if it didn't. Yeah, no, that's one of the other great things about The Expanse is the very striking, appealing, beautiful, bold we colors of the design. So, yeah. so lucky. We got so lucky with the, the art and the, the graphic design uh, from the beginning. That was just amazing. That yeah. helped a lot. And also, the other place we got really lucky, uh, Jefferson Mays, the guy who reads the books for the audiobooks, he's amazing. He, yeah, he's we, really good. We, we owe that guy dinner. Yeah, yeah, no, the audiobook's so important because that's how so many people engage with the with the story. All right, I also yeah. wanted to ask. Um, all right, this I've been wanting to ask for ages. So, so the Expanse originated as a tabletop role playing game that evolved into a book series and all these other things. Um, I understand George R. R. Martin is a friend of yours. He's in this New Mexico writing community, and he, I understand, was one of the players in one of the versions of this game. Yes. Did George R. R. Martin play a character? who in any way manifested in the modern version of The Expanse? No. No, he didn't. And he always gave me shit about that. He always <laughs> said, like, how come, how, come, how come Pinto hasn't shown up in the books or the show? P- Pinto. So in the, ga- in the game, George played a uh, belter dwarf. <laughs> so, so it's a, a belter who is like short, normal human size. But it's because they're a dwarf, but they're a belter dwarf. Oh, that's um, awesome. Aimed Pinto Vortondo. <laughs> the problem with that, like as much fun as Pinto Vortondo was as a character, Pinto Vortondo is a character from the old um uh shit, what was the what was the name of that that old The Sir the the, the the Yeah, I yeah. I'm 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 not I'll find out. Yeah, you can that, talk. The name of it is is uh, anyway. It was a it was a it was a serialized show that George watched in the, like the fifties, late forties, early fifties. Um, had this character who was like this this yellow menace character named Pinto Vortondo who who Rocky Jones uh, Space Ranger. Rocky Jones Space Ranger. He was a That's character. Uh, Rocky yeah. Jones Space Ranger. And the reason we have never used that character is because I'm not going to include the Yellow Menace character yeah. from Rocky Joe Space Ranger <laughs> yeah. in my TV show. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. Um, so that's why. Was, was this in any way like a sort of a space Tyrion Lannister? Because that's what I'm imagining. Uh, George has had a wide variety yeah. of uh, warps. I mean, he did the uh, the the one with the uh the journalist i don't remember i don't know if that one ever got published but no it's it's a it's he it's a, it's a thing he has gone to before mm. yeah all right i think um i i wanted to finish it up by just asking you guys for any anything you can tell us about the possibility of the expanse tv show continuing beyond season six because i, I know you guys have made some statements about it. it it's a pause it could continue what, what I, I know that you can't maybe tell me what's you know going to happen if we don't know what's going to happen but do you hope or envision envision 
continuing the Expanse TV show, covering the final trilogy of books uh, after a period of time? Will we wait 5, 10, 30 years and then film the last three seasons with the same actors? Or what? what is your <laughs> vision or your preference of what's going to happen here? Well, if you wait 30 years, I'll have been 25 years retired. So uh, <laughs> it, it won't be me. I, I, you know, that I will say that I think um, there is an appetite to finish the story. I think getting to the 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 actual end of the books um, in a filmed entertainment would be awesome. It would be great to stick the landing. And I think we're not, you know, I think that Ty thinks that, and eh, the guys that, that Alcon who who actually have the rights to it um, have pathways open to them. We'll see what happens. Cool. Yeah. Having said that, there, it, as with all of these things, there's a lot of moving parts, and yeah. in order for something to happen, a thousand things have to go right. In order for something not to happen, three things have to go wrong. So there's always the possibility that three things go wrong. And and it doesn't happen. That's but that's true of everything that you're trying to make in in Hollywood. So uh, that's always a possibility. Yeah, we've dodged but, a know, lot. I mean, if, of, if a thousand things go right, yeah, who knows what we dodged a we dodged a lot of bullets up till now. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, the expense has 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 been an incredible success story so far in terms of its you know cancellation then resurgence. It's the thing that keeps on keeps on chugging, keeps on flying like the Rossi. So I hope that it, uh, I hope that it continues on for many more years. And I cannot wait to read Leviathan Falls. And I look forward to the novella compilation and um, and to your other projects. I can't wait to see what comes next. Thank well, you very thanks, much, man. And uh, congratulations to you, man. You you uh, definitely turned your your channel into uh, <laughs> quite a successful thing, man. Oh, thank I mean, you so much. Yeah, it's uh, anybody who anybody who's a genre fan knows who you are. That's, uh, yeah, that's impressive. Truth. Yeah, look, it's I, impressive. I never dared to have that ambition, but I'm really glad that it turned out that way, and I'm really gratified that people are still watching, even though Game of Thrones has ended. Um, <laughs> so I hope that they'll keep on watching as I keep on covering. More like, new cool shit like uh, like like your work in the expanse. As long as you have the only three things that matter, like the only three things that matter in life are a partner that loves you, the suffering of your enemies, and a gold-plated <laughs> rocket car. As long as you have those three things, you'll be fine. You have succeeded. Well, I'll work yeah. on getting that rocket car. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Daniel Ty. It was uh, it was such a pleasure. Thanks for giving me your time. Always um, fun. Thanks, man. All right. All right. Till next time. Till next Bye. time. So that's part one of the interview. Part two is up as a second episode of this podcast, and it has all the juicy discussion of the later books of The Expanse, especially Persepolis Rising and Tiamat's Wrath, and it even has some small hints about the upcoming final book. So go check out the other part, and please subscribe to this podcast, and rate and review on Apple Podcasts, and check out our sponsor Curiosity Stream to help out this new show. Uh, but yeah, thanks for listening. <laughs>